from Chile is what's the story about Calvin and Grace? Did they have a romantic marriage? How did they meet? What should we know about them? Silent Cal is known as a dry figure, kind of etiolated, not someone you think of as romantic, but you know, he got one of the most beautiful wives of any president, Grace Coolidge. And I recommend uh, everyone take a look at her picture. Uh, she had uh, beautiful dark hair and she was lively and she looked good in anything she put on. And she was the first professional first lady because she not only had a BA, but also a training in her field, which was the instruction of the deaf. And that is how they met. She was going to school for the deaf, um, learning how, that is, she was learning how to instruct deaf children in Northampton, Massachusetts, and President Coolidge was there as a young lawyer, just Mr. Coolidge, and she saw him through a window and kind of got his attention uh, and a little bit flagged him down. So uh, in that case, uh, for the young lady, it paid off because they, they did go out together and subsequently married. What a wonderful story. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to What's the Res? Today I'm joined by a very special guest, Miss Amity Schlaes. Uh, and today we're going to be looking at the uh, work of the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation, and particularly in the world of debate. And Miss Schlaes work as the chairman of the board for the Coolidge Foundation and also as a scholar of Calvin Coolidge. My name is Josh Herring. I'm a debate coach at Thales Academy Rollsville. And today we are recording live at the third tournament of the year for the Luddy Debate League, uh, Luddy Schools Debate League and the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation's partnership doing a series of debate tournaments. Uh, welcome, Ms. Schlaes, to What's the Res? Thank you. And I, I should also uh, mention that Ms. Schlaes is a, uh, a, a quite a well-known author. She's written four New York Times bestsellers, those include The Forgotten Man, A New History of the Great Depression, The Forgotten Man, the graphic novel edition, Coolidge, and The Greedy Hand, How Taxes Drive Americans Crazy. Well, Ms. Schlaes, let's start off with uh, your interest in Calvin Coolidge. Where, where, did, you, where did that start? What, what made you interested in this president that, honestly, most of us don't know nearly enough about? Economics. If you really want to understand what happened in the 20th century, you look at the Great Depression, this abyss, and you see all that went wrong and all that policy could do wrong. And then very quickly you say, well, what's good policy? If that's bad policy, the 1930s and uh, the 20s was good economic policy. We had very strong growth. We didn't have much inflation. Sometimes we had deflation. Unemployment was nearly always low and everyone got a patent. It was a very inventive um, decade as decades go. So. Coolidge was the president behind that. Uh, very important for him were balancing the budget, uh, uh, spend it, generally restricting the federal government and sustaining the role of the states. Coolidge was a strong federalist. He always um, uttered the words United States as a plural. The United States are a good country. I like that. Uh, because he wanted to emphasize that the United States was made up of states. Uh, and he was an avid vetoer and tax cutter. He cut the top marginal rate on the income tax, which is the key rate when it comes to incentives for individuals, from up there in the 40s and 50s down to 25, which is a level we could only dream of today. That meant that no matter how much you earned, you only paid a quarter on your last dollar, which gave people a lot of energy. You, you want to compare that to, say, Ronald Reagan, who cut the top marginal rate as well, but only down to 28. Oh, that is fascinating. So I think we can, is it, is it fair to conclude from that, that Coolidge's economic activity as president indicates that there's a connection between a balanced budget and uh, economic flourishing? That is correct. Well, that's, uh, that, that's fantastic. Uh, I, I certainly will confess that I do not know nearly enough about Calvin Coolidge. And last summer when I had the chance to uh, attend the Coolidge Cup debate tournament, I learned a lot about uh, the, uh, the Coolidge Foundation and the life of Calvin Coolidge. Can you tell our, our listeners a little bit about the work of the Coolidge Foundation and, and maybe even just the setting as well? Because I, I distinctly remember just how beautiful uh, that place was. 
Calvin Coolidge was born in New England, in Vermont, which was in, in a rather modest area for the time. Uh, it's, it's Plymouth Notch, Vermont, and for those of you who know landmarks up there, it's not far from the ski resort Killington, and it's not far from Dartmouth College mm. or Castleton College. So wonderful little hamlet, well-preserved, kind of a northern Williamsburg of colonial life as Coolidge lived it. And even though he was born in 1872, it sure felt colonial. They didn't have electricity. They went, when it was icy, they would go down the road in a sleigh. They had to pack the snow to make the ice for the sleigh to go, and so on. So uh, that was his childhood. It was a little bit like uh, some stories by Edith Wharton or Nathaniel Hawthorne. Uh, then he grew into the 20th century. He went to electric. He went to Amherst College, and then he worked in Northampton, a town that had plenty of electricity, including trams and trolleys. Uh, and he was very much a, the, a man of the 20th century. So he's the past and he's the present. But we like to bring people back to the notch. We have a debate tournament there every summer around the 4th of July to see the past uh, as well, because Coolidge would not have been Coolidge had he not come from there. Well, that's, that is a fascinating reality. That's really interesting to think about how the way he grew up in that particular uh, village or hamlet, as you called it, really kind of shaped his, his presidency. Because I, I suspect the, the small town values that he, would, he picked up there substantially influenced really his concerns and his respect for small communities and for states and his concern for the realities of economics. Well, the, the, well you want to think of a Vermont town, and this is important for debaters, as a platform for debate. They had what they called select men, which were representatives in the town, or like, like a very junior version of aldermen, for mm. some of you who come from cities, with, or town representatives. And they would meet in a rather modest room, I think sometimes above the candy shop, Mrs. Silly's store, if you go. You can go see it now. It later became the summer White House. And they would argue things out and Coolidge would sell apples. So he watched his father um, go neutral when the question of raising a tax was broached because his father, though his father could pay the tax, understood that some other people could not. And this was all passed before him as theater when he was a very shy boy and he took it in and later um, Coolidge was a debater, it came out again this civic and civil discourse of the very small town. Well, that's a great transition to uh, my next question. Uh, so the Calvin Coolidge Foundation does a lot with debates, and we're here at a, a tournament that's really a result of the Coolidge Foundation's work in debate. Uh, help our audience understand some of why, why is the Coolidge Foundation interested in helping high schoolers learn how to debate and, and really debate well? Well, partly because Coolidge loved debate, and as we mentioned, he was shy. When he got to college, he wanted to be in a fraternity very badly, and eight in ten young men at Amherst at that time were in a fraternity, but he was not admitted to any fraternity. He was not tapped uh, until very late senior year. So you want to imagine a freshman who's left out. Mm. and isn't particularly good at sports. He used to say, I held the stakes. That is the things you poke in the ground for a game on turf. Uh, and yet Amherst was a school where debate was one of the methods of instruction and sport. And it turned out he was a good de debater. And he said to his father when he was senior, nothing makes me feel so good as that feeling that I may have delivered a good speech that I have delivered. He found his high, which is of course part of everything that we do. You know, your sport is your high point, mm. or your essay is your high point, and for him it was debate. And that led him to become a successful representative, first of the people of Northampton, and then of the state of Massachusetts, and all the way up, because he knew he could speak probably um, better than he thought, uh, but he also knew he learned to speak, and nobody spent more hours on the floor of a legislature uh, than Coolidge, who, who was a lawmaker in some form or other from age 25. So really, in working to uh, encourage high schoolers to debate and creating opportunities for high school debate, the Coolidge Foundation is fostering a unique sort of community where people can really find their, their sense of their passion and their, as you called it, their, their high point of achievement uh, in debate. 
That's right, and you can find the unexpected in yourself in debate. If you go to an all sports high school um, and you have no area to shine in this competition, there's chess, there are some online games, which are very exciting, there's fantasy gaming, right? Mm -hmm. And there's debate. And which is actually of the most utility? Since we're in a debate format, I'll say debate. Debate is of the most utility because the very same skills you use in debate, you use to get a job and keep it. Mm. it once you get a real job, often an element of it is presentation. So Josh here and I and Noah, our engineer, would have a meeting and we would argue through something. And uh, then Josh would have to make three points, mm -hmm. clearly and not bore the other people, but also convince us. It'd be very exciting. That comes from debate. And it's an opportunity to practice that and to speak with people and before people one doesn't normally speak with. You know, when one's in high school, it's all about teachers and peers and maybe parents. That's about it, right? Teachers, sure. peers, parents, coach, right? Mm -hmm. Minister. That's it. But there, there's something to be got out of other adults in the world if you meet a famous lawmaker or a famous musician, that changes your life too and enriches it. And it, debate is addressed more to that real mm -hmm. outside world. And with the Coolidge Foundation, we tend to try to get a r outsider, a non-high school teacher or a parent to work with the kids the day of our debate to address the topic. Sometimes we even get politicians mm -hmm. who actually have to argue the topic to speak to our debaters because you're drawn into the, the, the political world, let's say, or the policy world all at once through debate, even if you are only 14. Oh, that's absolutely true. I remember last time, uh, in, uh, this would have been in August, our first one of this year, we had State Senator Chad Barefoot was our content expert. Today we had a, uh, an economist from the University of Mount Olive delivering a lecture. I've talked with several of our judges, and I think I've met two small business owners, I've met one lawyer, and uh, I've met several uh, just uh, concerned citizens who are concerned about the future of our republic, and they're honestly quite encouraged at realizing that our students can study such a complicated topic as the national debt and develop uh, really nuanced positions on it. Well. Uh, now, I, I'd like to kind of uh, move towards uh, closing for just a moment by, uh, with, uh, I've just got two last questions uh, in this interview. Uh, Ms. Schles, where do you see the Coolidge Foundation's work with debate uh, moving in the next five to ten years? If, if we're dreaming, where well, would you see it Well, we're not even dreaming. We are. The Coolidge League, of which the Letty Schools are, um, are for which the Letty Schools um, are taking the lead, and through you, Josh, um, will expand. And the cool, what is the Coolidge League? The Coolidge League tends to focus on presidents and economics. Why? Because those two things are, are not always in, addressed in other leagues, not mm. because we dislike other leagues or think something different should be done. This is additive. But we do do econ. We do produce briefs, both sides, so that our debaters can argue the facts. That's very important to kids and parents. We emphasize topicality. And uh, we also, um, I think it's I'm, what I mentioned before, it's very important that we bring adults, both sides of any argument to, to a debate, so, or one of our debates, so kids can get a feel for the reality of both arguments. That is key. Um, we don't want our kids to take sides. We want them to be able to debate both sides mm, and so walk good. away um, feeling that later they'll make up their mind. <laughs> oh, that's a that's that's a great statement, and uh, uh, so I'm I'm excited to hear that this will be expanding in in coming years, and uh, maybe even some of those listening uh, will want to reach out to us at what's the res at gmail .com to uh, learn how they can become part of that going forward. There, there's one thing I did want to add. Any parents who are interested in debate and who are listening, we need you as judges. We need your input on how to do this. There are many so different true. formats of debate. Sometimes we do policy. Sometimes we do Lincoln-Douglas. You may have heard of that. Sometimes we do public forum. This is key, you know, what you think. We, for, for our judges, as adults, we try to use informed adults, sometimes who know something about this sport in high school. Sometimes people are just good citizens who will want to apply common sense to their debate 
judging. We welcome you. We'd very much like to start a debate camp for judges. Um, so any parents out there who'd like to support that, please let us know. Uh, admin at CoolidgeFoundation.org or um, the, the Luddy Schools. And we'll, we'll be sure to put all of those contact information details in the show notes to this episode. Well, uh, Ms. Schlaes, I just have one last question for you. Our, our audience for these episodes is ideally middle school and high school students who are thinking ahead about upcoming tournaments and trying to prepare. What advice would you give them about debate or, or even to their parents as they're trying to help their children prepare for a debate? Two things. One is you want to look at winning debates mm. and you, and you want to look on YouTube and see or whatever your debate camp is doing. That's very good to pick up. There are plenty of good debate camps too. We have one at Dartmouth we recommend highly uh, near us. But the second is think of the context of what you're debating in the real world and how um, a politician might debate the same topic. Because sometimes in a debate, you'll get lost and throw eight arguments out for, for the affirmative or the negative, whichever is your side, even though those arguments happen to contradict one another. Attorneys will do that too. But in a, in a general forum, your argument should be coherent. So you say, I am for this for three reasons that go together, and here they are. Ta-da, one, two, three. Not, uh, um, and you will win more often than you think you will if you do that. Uh, so that, that's my one bit of advice. Make sure your argument makes sense so that if you told it to a non-debate stranger, it would convince that stranger. Well, thank you for that excellent advice, Ms. Schlaes. Today, my guest on What's the Res has been scholar, author, and chairman of the board for the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation, Amity Schlaes. We're recording live at today's tournament. Ms. Schlaes, it has been a pleasure. Thank you for joining us on What's the Res. Thank you. You've been listening to What's the Res, an ongoing conversation about the current resolutions in the world of high school debate. Join us next time for more What's the Res. Thank you.